Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Heart Foundation of Jamaica's Emergency Cardiac Care Symposium. Our theme this time around is creating cardiac ready communities. My name is Kadian Milton, Senior Manager Marketing and Business Development here at the Heart Foundation. With the onset of COVID-19 and upward trajectory of the new Delta variant, heart health and cardiac care is becoming increasingly important in the health sector. Members of the board, Executive Director of the Heart Foundation of Jamaica, Mrs. Deborah Chen, presenters, distinguished guests, registrants, and representatives from the health sector, our sponsor, Jung Pharmacy, medical personnel, staff members of the Heart Foundation of Jamaica, special welcome to you all. The Emergency Cardiac Care Symposium is an annual event conceptualized and executed by the Heart Foundation of Jamaica during CPR week to provide a platform and space to facilitate critical, hard-hitting discussions among experts on topical issues surrounding heart health and cardiac care in Jamaica and to assess realistic and adaptable global best practices. This evening, this symposium will observe the theme, again, creating cardiac ready communities and feature didactic presentations from Director of Emergency Cardiac Care Training right here at the Heart Foundation of Jamaica, Dr. Hugh Wong, who will dissect the theme. The next presentation is courtesy of Mr. Damian Lloyd, First District Officer and EMS Educator at the Jamaica Fire Brigade. He will provide an assessment on the importance of chest compression in resuscitation, especially in these critical times. Finally, we will shift our focus to the sports industry with a presentation on creating cardiac ready sports society presented by sports medicine experts, Dr. Rhonda Hudson, consultant emergency physician from the University Hospital of the West Indies. Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be an exciting and informative afternoon. Of course, we want to hear from you, our participants. Please document your questions in the chat. And at the end of the presentations, we will go straight into the Q&A session. Without further ado, I now hand over to our first presenter, Ms. Dr. Hugh Wong. But before I do that, I'm going to read his bio. Renowned medical doctor, Dr. Hugh Wong, earned his slew of accolades from the University of the West Indies, Mona, and has committed a number of years in the field of medicine and public health in Jamaica, dating as far back as 1994. These days, he wears many hats and serves as the head of the department for the Accident and Emergency Unit at the Kingston Public Hospital. He sits on the boards of a National Resuscita Resuscitation Council and Heart Foundation of Jamaica, and also serves the foundation as the Director of Emergency Cardiac Care Training. Dr. Wong is a member of the Jamaican Emergency Medicine Association, the Association of Government Medical Consultants, the Medical Association of Jamaica, and is a licensed member of the Medical Council of Jamaica since 1996. Again, ladies and gentlemen, I hand over to Dr. Wong. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I wish to thank the Heart Foundation once again for um, putting together this important symposium. Um, as from my introductions, I have an interest in the ECC and therefore, So here's um, so this is very important to me because what we know is that the, the earlier someone has an issue and the earlier we can start um, CPR, then the outcomes are better. And there are many studies in the world that show that the person that is going to provide that CPR for you is the person standing next to you. So without further ado into my presentation, 
of creating cardiac ready communities. So we need to keep the heart happy and bouncing. And the concepts of a cardiac ready community program are one, to support bystander emergency responder and community private public partnerships. Two, to threaten community based capacity for cardiac and stroke emergency response. Now, the concept of a cardiac ready community is defined as one that has met the criteria of having lay persons trained in CPR public access to automated external defibrillators, a system of screening, particularly for blood pressure, diabetes, and so on, the necessity for a functional emergency medical service, and of course, the provision of local hospitals for those who have been resuscitated to go to hospitals. So this follows the chain of survival as is dictated by the American Heart Association in 2020. Why is there a need for such a program? Well, that is to treat patients who go into cardiac arrest. And cardiac arrest is defined as cessation of cardiac mechanical activity and is confirmed by the absence of circulation. Sudden cardiac arrest is unexpected cardiac arrest or cardiac arrest occurring within one hour of the onset of symptoms. So what is the, 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 the burden of cardiac arrest? Well, worldwide, sudden cardiac arrest is the leading, one of the leading causes of death. In the United States, where we get our figures from, it is the leading cause of death, claiming an estimated 350,000 lives each year. Of these, 164,000 occur out of hospital, and sudden cardiac arrest kills about 1,000 people a day or one person every two minutes. As many as up to 75% of persons who die of sudden cardiac arrest have shown signs of having had a previous heart attack. And at autopsy, 80% have signs of coronary artery disease. Now, 80% of cardiac arrests that occur outside of hospital occur in or near home. And I would suspect that the other 20% occur at work. Spouse or other family members are most likely to witness this arrest. It is estimated that 95% of victims of cardiac arrest die before they reach hospital or get help from another emergency source. For Jamaica, there's no data available but I suspect out of hospital cardiac arrest has about 100% mortality. Local um, figures for um, cardiac arrest out of hospital, there are no published studies found in the literature. Um, in 2014, some residents at my department prepared and presented a study on patients who suffered in hospital cardiac arrest. And it's just to show you that the studies can be done. And just briefly, the name was an audit of cardiopulmonary resuscitations in the Accident and Emergency Department at the Kingston Public Hospital. The primary um, researcher was Dr. Tawanda Jones. And the study sought to document the outcomes of resuscitation efforts on all patients serially who had cardiopulmonary um, resuscitation initiated while in the a &E department. And this is our findings. Following CPR, the immediate survival rate was 18%. That is, we had a return of spontaneous circulation of about 18% of the patients while in the ER. 48 hours later, half of them had died. That went down to 9%. And 5% were able to be discharged from hospital. Now, why is it that we think that um, bystander CPR is important? Well, Camila Sasson, MD, in 2010 showed that the numbers would increase the survival to discharge increased when patients received um, bystander CPR, okay? 
or it was when it was witnessed by EMS. The problem is EMS is not around, so we depend on our bystander CPR to increase survival after discharge, as shown by uh, Sasson. Right, and the 2020 chain of survival, which simply states that there are now six rings to that, that chain, that includes immediate recognition of cardiac arrest and activation of the emergency response system, early CPR with an emphasis on high quality chest compressions, rapid defibrillation, effective basic and advanced life support, integrated post cardiac arrest care, and the sixth chain recently added, recovery and rehabilitation. Now, how can we, how can a cardiac arrest society improve survival from cardiac arrest? The steps are universal, you know, and these, and here they are. We need to increase public awareness of such cardiac arrest. Increase CPR training for citizens, laypersons. Increase the availability of AEDs. Provide EMS that is available and accessible to all communities. Equip hospitals to be able to provide advanced care to patients who have returned of spontaneous circulation. Equip the health services to provide post-recovery care in the community. And uh, finally, and probably very most importantly, well, just as important, establish regional and national cardiac arrest registries. How do we increase public awareness? Well, public education programs and the Heart Foundation over the years through this very week of activities, right? Has been putting on programs to encourage learning and maintaining skills in CPR by lay persons. We probably need to introduce CPR in schools programs, which Heart Foundation has done. Considering the implementation of ADs throughout the community by legislation or otherwise and promoting the immersive phone numbers for our emergency services, 110-119. Citizen CPR training. So the OPAL study of 1998, and in red you will read, in order to save lives, healthcare planners should make cardiopulmonary resuscitation by citizens and rapid defibrillation responses a priority for the resources of emergency medical service systems. And they noted also that the addition of advanced life support interventions did not improve the rate of survival after out of hospital cardiac arrest. Basically, what they say, it does not matter how much advanced care that a patient receives. If they did not receive early CPR and defibrillation, they would not survive to discharge. So the, the, having the high polluted systems does not increase survivability if your basic CPR is not done. So um, the National Association Council, an NGO formed by the Ministry of Ed, um, Health, and um, of which I am the chairman just now, in 2019, 2020, we proposed to the Chase Fund to sponsor island-wide layperson training in CPR and ADUs. The intent was for one year of training, and the providers or the instructors would come from all our agencies that do CPR training, the Heart Foundation, Red Cross, um, different providers. And we proposed this for 2019, 2020. However, due to COVID-19, our plans were derailed. And currently we are still awaiting confirmation of funding and we aim to begin as soon as the privilege conditions allow. So that is one step in layperson training. Public access defibrillation. So in February, 2003, there was a PAD trial Lay persons were trained in the use of ADs plus CPR in USA and Canada. And a study showed that patients in out of hospital cardiac arrest who received defibrillation had more survivors than who received CPR only. There were other studies that showed also that there was a marked increase in survival rates, survival rates when there was a bystander use of an AD. Currently, there is no law in Jamaica mandating ADs in public spaces. However, some entities to maintain their international recognition and standing have had to equip their operations with ADs 
and you recognize that our international airports, um, some local businesses, some banks as well, have placed AED, AEDs in their operations. And in fact, we propose that AEDs should be in every setting where there is expected of a mass gathering of more than 200 persons. And that's what an AED looks like, right? Very simple to use, called defibrillation for the untrained. Emergency medical services. There needs to have EMS available and accessible to all communities. In the short term, we should probably focus on those communities in which EMS currently exists. And um, if you're familiar with our EMS system in Jamaica, we have um, providers in Ironshore, Negril, Southern Lamar, Lucy, Falmouth, Linstead, and Waterford that are provided by the Jamaica Fire Brigade, right? But the services really um, centered on those geographical locations. So the water Jamaica has, is, has not had the benefit of those services. Right? So we'd have to increase our EMS services and probably in the short term to provide for um, cardiac credit communities, we choose one of these communities where an EMS actually currently exists. And of course, we need to staff and equip these ambulances appropriately. And these are our, our colleagues at the EMS. Hospitals. For a cardiac ready society, we must have care in our hospitals. All hospitals that are served by EMS should have the ability to provide advanced care for patients who are brought in by the EMS in cardiac arrest or have had return of spontaneous circulation. Therefore, there must be trained staff, equipment, ICU beds, and associate cardiac rehab units in these hospitals. And I couldn't leave that section about hospitals without showing you KPH at dust. That's my hospital. Beautiful picture of my hospital. Best looking hospital in Jamaica, I would say. Right. Yeah. We also need to provide cardiac um, recovery. Um, so this includes exercise counseling and training, education for heart health living, and counseling to reduce stress. These are the, 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 the parts that make up cardiac rehabilitation. Registries. Now there's no point in having data without being able, well, we have to collect data and use the data. So we need to have data and we insist that a registry must be set up. And a registry is required because they provide invaluable sources of information on the incidents, management, and outcomes of out of hospital cardiac arrest in the community, can be used to generate hypotheses for research or even clinical trials in collaboration with international registries, adds to the body of knowledge of resuscitation science. We can use our registry to assess resuscitation in different locales, different health regions within the same country to assess the effect of CPR training. So Heart Foundation and the Ministry of Health has been training for many years. Does, does this training have an impact on resuscitation? We need to know. It also identifies gaps within our system that we can plug and improve. And of course, the data will drive local and national initiatives in resuscitation. Okay. So at the cardio on that's pulmonary, let's get on to implementation. So we have discussed the reasons why and the things necessary to form a cardiac ready society community. How do we implement? One, we need to analyze the current situation in the community, create a support team, record our interventions, assess and complete a checklist, designate the community cardiac ready or not. And once we've done that, then we repeat in another community. Let's analyze the current situation. Are there community-based organizations that provide preventative services, blood screening, et cetera, in the community? You can save up for the questions. Let's make a mark, make a note of what you think of these. 
what percentage of the population is trained in CPR? Do places of public gatherings and businesses have ADs and staff training their use? Is there an emergency medical service? Does the community have an equipped hospital? Are there cardiac rehabilitative services? And we can answer those questions after. In terms of implementation team, you need to have somebody who's going to drive the process, all right? And then you're going to have buy-in from the political directorate. Um, if you're talking about a local community, then you may talk about councillors or the MPs. The EMS has to be involved as well as fire and police, public health, CPR instructors, are very important because they will be teaching the laypersons um, CPR. The business community has to have a buy-in because they may very well have to fund the processes or media houses to drive the, um, drive the, the process to make everybody aware of what's happening. Um, I put in social media influencers because we're now in the age of social media that probably reaches more persons than um, the normal usual media houses. Of course, our hospitals and clinics and very importantly, survivors of cardiac arrest who can tell their story. So these are the persons we need to have on our team. We need to record our interventions. So we need to write down all our meetings to our stakeholders, what outcomes were. We need to make sure we know how much persons have been trained in CPR. We assess our cardiac survival rates. We make sure we know where our grants and funding coming from. And of course, we need to know what our media promotions are doing. And when we establish, say we, we choose a community, let's choose a small community. Let's, let's choose Lucy, right? Then you have to have a check, checklist. So you will have to say how much persons have had lay person CPR training in Lucy. How much ADs does Lucy have? Is there agencies or an agency that offers screening? Do they have access to an EMS service? Is there a local hospital that's equipped to treat these patients? Are there cardiac rehabilitative services within that community? And is there established um, resuscitation registry established in that community? If all these are checked positive, then we can designate Lucy as a cardiac ready community. And of course, once we check that, we have that checklist, all right, we can designate them as cardiac ready. All right. Um, the designation is for a fixed period of time, and we have to reassess at the end of that period, and all of the criteria have to be maintained for that designation to remain. So, in summary, survival from cardiac arrest can be improved by early lay person CPR and defibrillation. Cardiac ready communities aim to make each community ready to provide this early care. Cardiac ready communities are like building blocks of a national response to auto hospital cardiac arrest. And the communities work with a checklist and implementation guide. And these communities require recertification, right? As long as they're compliant with the set guidelines. And I think that's the end of my presentation. Let us see. Yes, it is. Thank you very much. I'll ask the sponsor to have their presentation. Sponsor's presentation. If you have any questions, you can post them in the chat.
Thank you so much, Dr. Wong. Or we're gonna ask our sponsor for this event, Jung Pharmacy, to please go ahead with their presentation. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Am I being heard okay? Okay. Uh, good afternoon again. My name is Doreen Williams, Director and Chief Pharmacist of June Pharmacy. Congratulations to Heart Foundation on 50 years of excellent service to Jamaica. Thanks again also for this opportunity to sponsor this awesome event. It is my privilege this evening to introduce Jung Pharmacy and its services. Can you start the presentation, please? Would you like me to share my screen? Okay, Ms. Williams, please go ahead and share your screen. This year, Jung Pharmacy is celebrating 10 years of service. Since we opened our doors in 2011, Jung Pharmacy has since become a household name in the neighboring communities. We offer a wide range of over-the-counter prescription medications at reasonably low prices. We also provide in-house testing of blood pressure, blood sugar, and cholesterol as part of our disease monitoring patient center program. So how have we responded to the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, we have made it even easier for patients to access their medications while staying safe. These stay safe, safe time services include our express in-house service where patients can WhatsApp their prescriptions and skip the line. We offer curbside service where patients can drop off their prescriptions and pick up pharmacy items curbside. Uh, and our Tanaya Yard service, which is a delivery service where senior citizens and other vulnerable groups can have their pharmacy items delivered to their home. How, how are we playing our part in the vaccination effort? Well, Jung Pharmacy and Jung Supermarket, Jung, Jung Pharmacy in collaboration with Jung Supermarket has offered our location as a future community vaccination site. We have pharmacists on staff who are trained immunizers. So we're able to provide credible and factual information to staff to support their decision-making process, make appointments upon request, and to allow staff the time needed to get vaccinated. What's not listed here is our ongoing collaboration with the Portmore Health Center, where our site is offered for free HIV testing um, on scheduled weekends. This is a chart showing the pharmacy services offered at June Pharmacy. And we additionally, we provide repeat prescription management, brown bagging services, we store certified medication items, and provide senior citizens with discounts and we also offer FFK discounts along with so much more. Uh, there's a jingle attached to the last slide. So I'm gonna invite you to listen to it. If you're not hearing it, please let me know.
Thanks again to the Heart Foundation for giving us this opportunity to present our pharmacy and service services offered to our community. And uh, excellent presentation so far. And all the best for another 50 years of service, Jamaica. Thank you so much, Ms. Williams. And thanks again to the Joan Pharmacy for your sponsorship of our ECC symposium this evening. Now, our next speaker, I'm so proud to introduce Mr. Damien Lloyd. He is a graduate of the University of Technology, Jamaica, and has amassed some 17 years of service in the Jamaica Fire Brigade, where he has moved up the ranks and currently serves as a district officer and EMS educator. Mr. Lloyd is an experienced emergency service responder with a demonstrated history of working in public safety and medical systems. He possesses strong paramilitary and military and protective services skills and is professionally trained in customer service, public safety, government, and safety code enforcement. He is also an emergency medical responder with, emer with experience as an emergency medical educator. Mr. Lloyd is certified and registered with the National Association of EMS Educators. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our next speaker, Mr. Damian Lloyd. Pleasant afternoon to everyone. Pleasant afternoon, esteemed uh, panel and our guest speakers. Thank you for the invitation to present on saving the community one compression at a time. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR is one of the is one of the most important and universally practiced methods in the world, first aid methods in the world. CPR is the only first aid treatment proven to save lives of a sudden cardiac arrest or SCA victim until further help arrives. Now globally, as was said in our previous presentation by Dr. Wong, cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac arrest takes more lives than most forms of can cancer, influenza, pneumonia, and even more common household fires. Statistics out of the World Health Organization shows that 7 million lives are lost per year to sudden cardiac death, and a mass total of 17.9 million persons die from cardiovascular diseases. Now, throughout the age range of persons that were examined, we find that there is a varying difference in terms of how many persons die from cardiac arrest, with the majority of persons dying from sudden cardiac arrest being within the age group or age range of 70 or more years old. However, we do see an increase in the statistics from age 18 to 39, where we're having younger persons succumbing to sudden cardiac arrest. Sudden Cardiac Arrest Foundation Sports-related sudden cardiac arrests account for 39% of cardiac deaths for persons 18 years and older, with 13% of those in the it would fall in within the 19 to 25 year year group. 7% of those persons, or 7% of the 39, would also fall within the 35, 25 to 34 year group. Now locally we had one registered or one documented case in July of 29th, 2019 of a sports-related cardiac arrest death, student footballer who collapsed in the bleachers of the St. Elizabeth Technical Sporting Complex during a football match. Now, it is important that we recognize that the severity of cardiac arrest out of hospital increases the likelihood of losing multiple persons per performance or per day based on non-treatment. The Center for Disease Control published in 2021, January, that 7% of sudden cardiac arrest happens, happens at home with nine out of 10 persons who are affected by cardiac arrest out of hospital succumbing to this condition. CPR, if performed at first few minutes of sudden cardiac arrest can double or triple a person's chance of survival. CPR forms a 
forms one link in the chain of survival as it, as it is dictated by the American Heart Association. It is a second rung in the ladder to getting casualties or persons who suffer from sudden cardiac arrest to recovery. Now CPR, as we know it, was developed in the late 50s, 1950s, and was added on or emphasized during the 1960s. CPR, the mouth-to-mouth -mouth version of CPR, was established by Elthaman Schaefer, as described in the 19, in 1958, with Hohenhoven Ho adding a paper on the benefits of chest compressions with a combination of mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation to form the basis of what is known as our current practice of modern CPR. External defibrillation was later expounded or added on as described in 1957 and now incorporates both the application of ventilation, chest compressions, and external defibrillation to form the basis of resuscitation guidelines for basic life support. Now, the two early methods that were used to do chest compressions were the Hall method, where the casualty was rolled from chest to side, and the Sylvester method, where the casualty's arms were raised above the head and then, and then lowered to the abdomen in order to get the chest to rise and fall. The American Heart Foundation in 19, sorry, the American Heart Association in 1963 formally endorsed cardiopulmonary resuscitation as the primary response to sudden cardiac arrest. And in 1966, they emphasized and standardized the guidelines for lay rescue resuscitation, giving way to what we call the modern day CPR for, but for lay persons. How do we improve? The key to survival for sudden cardiac arrest is early recognition. Being able to recognize the signs and symptoms of, of sudden cardiac arrest and the implementation of appropriate treatment, the immediate initiation of excellent CPR and early defibrillation would be key for us to maintain active response to, to sudden cardiac arrest and to improve the standing of persons who will be suffering from such an impasse. Confirm that the incident is a sudden cardiac, cardiac arrest in recognition. Three steps that we can use to confirm that it is sudden cardiac arrest is a sudden collapse of the casualty. Upon examination, we see that the casualty is, has no breath zones, no exchange of air in the body, and the person has lost consciousness for a prolonged period. Beginning CPR, we always refer back to the foundations, beginning with our emergency scene management. The scene survey, safety for the rescuers. Now, it has always been taught from, from the foundation of first aid into CPR that an unsafe scene is an unsafe scene for everyone, including the rescuers. So we try to emphasize that once the scene is not safe, we make alternative actions to make the scene safe. Then we begin with our primary survey, looking at the ABCs of first aid, airway, breathing, and circulation. The next step in emergency scene management would be to call for help. This can be done by the use of technology, by activating your emergency responders, or calling out for bystanders, like trained as yourself, to send and also sending for an AED. CPR begins with, for adults, 30 compressions, five to six centimeters in depth, 100 to 120 compressions, effectively per minute, five cycles of compressions, before we do a reassessment. After determining that the person is unconscious or unresponsive and not breathing, we manually open the airway using the head tilt chin lift maneuver. Now this maneuver is only used if we do not suspect the person of having a head and spinal injury or suffering from other serious traumatic injuries. We look and feel for the rise and fall of the chest. Basic life support, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, and when available, the introduction of an automated external defibrillator, an AED. So this is the treatment for sudden cardiac arrest, even by lay persons. 
Now, chest compressions form the foundation of CPR. Chest compressions squeeze the heart between the sternum and the spine, thereby pumping blood out of the heart to the rest of the body, especially to the brain. Now, chest compressions can be done or should be done using hands or a mechanical device such as an automate, automatic compression machine. For laypersons who would not have access to these machines, the, the technique used to compress the chest for an adult would be two hands interlocking the fingers using the heel of the palm to depress the sternum. For a child, any, any, uh, uh, any person between the age of one and eight years internationally and one and 12 locally, we will use one palm placing the heel of the palm to compress the chest 30 compressions at least two inches deep. And for the infant, we recognize that we would use, based on the size of the infant, two fingers to compress the chest. This is how we do it. What do we do? We push hard and we push fast. Now it is your time to participate. I'm going to ask you to do in the chat, pick a side. Left or right would mean the difference between life and death. Place your answers in the chat. Now, conventional CPR is twofold. Part one being multiple resuscitation, or as we all know, the breath of life. The second part is the chest compressions. When you push down hard and fast on the person's chest more than once a second, pressing down at least an inch to an inch and a half before releasing or allowing the body to naturally recoil. The American Heart Association is, has issued and continues to issue, along with our local resuscitation council, the call to action for bystanders who are not trained in conventional CPR to use hands only or chest compressions only CPR without rescue breaths. And why are we doing this? Hands only CPR is just as effective as traditional CPR with rescue breaths. And in the first few minutes of our out of hospital sudden cardiac arrest, it has been shown statistically that it improves the response for the, the casualty. And it also offers them a greater percentage or chance of recovering from that sudden cardiac arrest. The training in hands-only CPR is one of the most vital resources that resources to be imparted at the community level. It now forms the focused response to sudden cardiac arrest, especially as we are faced with our current pandemic of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Hands-only CPR or bystander CPR may reduce the time to initiate CPR and result in the delivery of a greater number of chest compressions with fewer interruptions for the first several minutes after out of hospital cardiac arrest. Now, statistics again have shown that persons who suffer from sudden cardiac arrest based on time frame have a likelihood of recovering completely or partially given CPR is initiated within the first five to, to 15 minutes post the sudden onset of the sudden cardiac arrest. Now, this chart shows or de depicts the difference between, in terms of percentages, the difference between witnessing of a sudden cardiac arrest and the initiation of CPR by a bystander who is trained versus the non-witnessing of cardiac arrest, but still the initiation of CPR by persons who are trained. And it is important to recognize that the training of persons in, in bystander CPR is is and will always be sufficient to raise the level or the percentage of persons who survive out of hospital sudden cardiac arrest. Now, once you have started CPR, when do you stop? We do not stop until the STOP acronym has been implemented. Patient starts to breathe, breathe or has a pulse. The patient is transferred to another trained responder you are totally out of strength, meaning that you are no longer giving 
efficient and effective chest compressions, or you are directed to discontinue by a physician. Now, once the person has started to recover from the sudden cardiac arrest based on your interventions, giving CPR hands only and the introduction of a defibrillator, the patient is normally placed in what is known as the recovery position. Now, the recovery position, A, maintains a clear or patent airway, allows vomitus and other secretments to flow from the mouth without hindrances, and is, however, is not permitted for patients who you suspect of having a head or spinal injury. A holistic approach, a holistic approach or an involved community-based grassroots approach to sudden cardiac arrest needs to be conceptualized and implemented. This would see the combination of several strategies being undertaken as a collaborative effort by stakeholders and the community to improve the response and general outcome of most basic out-of-hospital medical emergencies to include sudden cardiac arrest. Strategies may include, but are not restricted to, those listed in our previous presentations by Dr. Wang, to include community-based medical response plan and planning, AED training and sensitization programs and the installation, strategic installation of AEDs within our communities. Prime locations would be pharmacies, would be business centers, would be the corner shop that would be open to the public at a most or all convenient times. And number three, an effective bleeding control program, such as implemented by the military, stop the bleed programs that would teach persons how to prevent blood loss and restrict cardiac arrest. Now in conclusion, improved survival rates depend on a nation trained and motivated to recognize medical emergencies of any nature, respond effectively and decisively, rendering aid or activating the emergency, res emergency response services. The more prepared the community is, the stronger the nation's response. And in closure, we want to emphasize that the training at the community level is most important based on the fact that we do not have a fully effective emergency medical service. So the greater persons that we can train across the platform of at the community level, adding to the already large cohort of persons who are working within the emergency services, we will improve the standard of survival or survivability for persons suffering, suffering from sudden cardiac arrest. And we will ease the burden of the advanced medical care once they actually make it to the hospital. I want to thank you all for your time. And if there are any questions, you may post it in the chat. Thank you. Hello? Hello? I'm hearing you, Damien. I'm hearing you. Admin, are you hearing me? Uh, yes, Mr. Lloyd, we're hearing you. Thank you so much for that very informative presentation.
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kelisia Williams. I'm the Business Development Manager here at the Heart Foundation. And I'm just going to do a quick uh, run through of everything that we do at the foundation. So the Heart Foundation of Jamaica is located at 28 Beechwood Avenue, Kingston 5. We are open Monday to Thursday, 8 a.m. to 3.30, to 4.30 p.m., sorry, and Fridays, 8 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., as well as we're open every other Saturday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Now, a lot of you guys know that we are um, an essential business, and as such, we are indeed open on the designated no-movement days during our normal opening hours. We invite you to just, you know, advise your patients and know, know for yourself as well that we are open and you can make an appointment with us at 876-334-4998 to confirm your test to be done. We offer medical services, but we also have a full service pharmacy that offers everything from your DPH, heart medication, anything that you can think about, we have it at our pharmacy. We also have screening services ranging from basic and advanced screening. So echocardiogram, blood pressure, BMI, total cholesterol, blood sugar, hemoglobin, HbA1c, um, cholesterol profile, all the basic tests that you can think about. We have here in office at 28 Beachwood Avenue, and we also have it on our mobile team. Um, and yes, I said mobile, meaning we go island wide and provide screening services uh, at health fairs, churches, companies, community groups. Uh, once you have a group of about 10 or more persons and you would like screening to be done, you can contact me at 876-332-8389 to schedule a screening to be done on a date of your choosing at a location of your choosing, providing that you have the space for social distancing, of course, you know, we're living in the COVID-19 era. So this slide is just giving you a more detailed or a listing rather of all the basic services that we offer in-house and on our mobile team. I mentioned before that we have advanced services. Uh, here's a list of those. We have the ambulatory, hold and monitor, stress echo, the butamine stress echo, bubble echo, uh, you name it, we have it and we do it here by appointment and with a referral. So doctors, here you go, we invite you to uh, remember that we do these tests and you can make a referral to your patients to come and have these tests here. If you do not have one of our referral pads, again, you can give me a call at 876-332-8389 and I can have one or a few packaged and sent directly to you. We also have clinics in-house. Diabetes clinic, hypertension clinic, both are run by Dr. Paul Wright every Thursday and Friday. Uh, from 8 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Walk-in, no appointment is needed for Dr. Paul Wright's clinic. He is also our GP here, general practitioner. So you can visit us during those hours if you would like that service to be done. We also have a cardiac clinic, which is operated by appointment, again, Monday through Saturday by seven cardiologists. Now I mentioned before that we did ECGs. It's important to note and I think this is a thing that is very important and is needed. All of our ECGs are not only read by a machine, but they're also read by a cardiologist before the result is given to a patient. So you're assured that your result and everything is, you know, it's very fulsome and you are getting the best medical care that you can get from us. Now for the part of the foundation that is the reason for this symposium is our emergency cardiac care training courses. Our courses are certified by the American Heart Association. The certificate issued is valid for two years and it is internationally recognized again by the AHA American Heart Association. And we have courses for medical and non-medical persons. I'm going to touch first on the non-medical persons we have heart saver courses, so that's heart saver CPR, heart saver first aid, and the combination of both of them. Also, for all of our courses, you're taught how to use an AED. Dr. Wong and Mr. Lloyd touched on the importance of AEDs in their presentation, and I just want to reinforce and reemphasize how important an AED is. Um, the statistic that I love, I shouldn't even say love, but I love to use is that for every minute that a person in need of defibrillation goes without it, their chances of survival decrease 
by about seven to ten percent. Okay, so let's take it into context. If you are, if you witness somebody in cardiac arrest and they are in need of the AED, you're at your workplace, you're at your doctor's office or wherever, and you do not have that on standby. You're like, okay, let me call the ambulance. Ambulance will get here. If it takes even ten minutes, at the lowest point, at seven percent, at ten minutes without defibrillation, that person's chances of survival decreased by seventy percent. Whereas if you had the AED on standby and you received training in its use, then you could have acted on it in a minute or two, three minutes tops to just run and get it, right? So that is just how important it is to have an AED on hand. It doesn't matter if you are medical or not, the AED uses voice prompts and messages and the pads that are attached to it, they have uh, graphics on them that show you where on the body to place it. So you really are able to use it very easily. There is literally no need to worry. The Heart Foundation sells AEDs. We facilitate the servicing of them and we train persons in its use. And we have warranty on the AED, right? One year warranty. If you'd like to make a purchase of an AED, you can give me a call at 876-332-8389. We have a special going on them until the end of this month. Uh, to highlight CPR week. We have a special until August 31st, offering an AED at 20% discount the original cost. Uh, the cost is 260,000 and the delivery is about two to four weeks for it to get to you. Now, as it relates to the advanced courses that we offer for the um, medical professionals, we have um, advanced cardiac life support, ACLS, we have Pediatric Advanced Cardiac Life Support PALS, Basic Life Support, and ECG Dysrhythmia. CME hours are given for all our medical courses. For ACLS and PALS, it's 15 hours. And for ECG Dysrhythmia and BLS, it is six hours. These courses are scheduled monthly. For Basic Life Support, it's every Monday and Friday. ACLS, it's, um, it's every month, once a month for two days. ECG and Pediatric Advanced Cardiac Life Support. It's every three months. For more information on the dates or to schedule a class, you can give me a call at 876-332-8389, or you can visit our website at heartfoundationja.org. Our course dates are listed, and you can make payments online and collect your manual, which is included in the cost for all the courses. All right, so again, 876-332-8389 to contact me or businessdev at heartfoundationja.org. All right, and that is some of the services of the foundation. I look forward to hearing from a lot of you very soon. Thank you so much, Kelisia. And I certainly too look forward to hearing from you. All right, so we move on now to our final speaker, Dr. Rhonda Hudson, a native of Georgetown, Guyana. Dr. Hudson is a proud alum of the Holy Childhood High School in Kingston. After leaving high school, she went on to study at the University of the West Indies, where she earned her Bachelor of Surgery and Medicine degrees. Again, in 2001, she received a Master of Science and later a Doctor of Medicine degrees with a focus in emergency medicine in 2002, respectively. With an aptitude for advancement, Dr. Hudson in 2009 received her Master of Science in Sports Medicine and is also now a certified sexual assault examiner and a trainer of sexual assault management in Jamaica. Dr. Hudson is currently employed as a consultant emergency physician at the University Hospital of the West Indies and is an associate lecturer at the UWI Mona. She is a team physician and physician to Jamaican athletes for local and international games and has served the sport fraternity at the Central and American Games in Puerto Rico in 2010, Mayaguez in 2015, the Pan American Games in Guadalajara in 2011, Toronto in 2015, 
Lima in 2019, and the Commonwealth Games at Glasgow in 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Hudson. Everyone, and I thank Dr. Wong and the Heart Foundation for inviting me to share with you today. I would like to personally recognize Sister Nancy McIntosh, headmistress of Holy Child High School. We begin the premise that exceptions or persons should be encouraged to participate in physical activity and exercise. Exercise or training for sport or general physical fitness typically the goal of improving performance. Therefore, activities. So Hudson, we are not hearing you clearly on our end. I'm not sure if everyone else is having a challenge. I don't have headphones. All right, Dr. Hudson, you may go ahead. Oh, thank you, I'm actually going to All right, so I was saying to the person that I thank Dr. Wong at the Health Foundation for allowing me to participate in this decision today, and that I'd like to personally recognize the vaccine that we got, or the principle of Holy Child Health. So we start with the premise that with very few exceptions, all persons should be encouraged to participate in physical activity and exercise. So mind yourself therefore what an athlete is, is going to engage in a regular exercise or training for sport or general physical fitness. Typically, with the goal of improving performance. Therefore, it's not fairly unfair the price is not the, the only athlete. But you and I are athletes if we engage in regular physical activity. It's perhaps intuitive to say that readiness for sport, which should include good general and muscular physical health, appropriate fitness level, good nutrition and good cardiovascular health. All of this would be aimed not only at improving performance, but improving or ensuring safe participation in sport. Any discussion of cardiovascular readiness or targeted readiness in sport and exercise will include a discussion almost in um, entirely on study target death and of that case. But it's to, to bear in mind that the asymptomatic, it is often the first manifestation that it was on the land side of that disease. It is even part of death and death. And it is almost four times most like, more likely to occur in those aspects of the case in force compared to those. The incidence of sudden cardiac death or sudden cardiac arrest varies according to region and city, but it is generally felt that it is uncommon when you compare all conditions that an athlete we get into. Of the many causes of sudden cardiac death, 
hypertrophic cardiomyopathy (HPM) or uh, a, a, a particular kind of, of large heart accounts for the majority of cases of sudden cardiac death, and the others there. And predominantly, what happens is that with the presence of underlying disease, the risk usually the patient gets an abnormal rhythm and then dies um, if there is no prompt care. In some of that, a case report showed that over the, a four year period, there were six cases. Four of them were due to congenital heart anomaly, and they were all male. The response to the sudden cardiac death includes any person or any athlete who is in company to sports, whether you're young or old. The older you are, the risk of sudden cardiac death increases due primarily to the presence of atherosclerosis in cases with the coronary artery disease. Importantly, to understand in this particular age group that the higher the vigorous activity is the higher the risk of death. But if the person exercises regularly, even when they participate in vigorous activity, that risk could be reduced. An interesting study coming out of France showed that 90% of cases of sudden cardiac death occurred not during competitive sports, but during recreational sports across all since the, the um, age group, from young to old. Other risk factors include males, persons who are African American, or there are um, persons who engage in football and basketball. The majority of the cardiac death tend to occur in these two certain activities. Notwithstanding, it is the recommendation across all entities that moderate physical activity should be promoted in all individuals, even if you have cardiovascular disease. So then how can we prepare a cardiac ready certain activity? Well, we would like to correctly diagnose covert disease to try to detect underlying disease and identify factors, choose appropriately, and then make a decision as to whether or not there should be participation. All of that can be embodied in what you call cardiovascular screening in an attempt to try to determine these factors. And this is considered to be a systematic practice of evaluation before participation in sports for the purpose yes, of identifying disease and or factors that may predispose to sudden death. And generally, we saw that that is what it does. It screens, identifies, and so we can treat. But interestingly, that not only does it do that, but part of the aim is included in that is to disqualify athletes from participation apart from ensuring they get treatment, while at the same time ensuring that the screen is not used to disqualify them unless there is a compelling medical reason. Cardiovascular conditions is found in about 10% of all athletes when they do their screening. This study shows that the, the thing that really causes sudden cardiac death are what I like to call the bodies, right? Those Parkinson's white syndrome, the long QT syndrome, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and so on here. And all of these really predisposes the athletes or an abnormal beating of the heart, which can lead to sudden death. But what are some of the controversies? And there are many. And it relates particularly to what exactly should the screening look like. Is it just history and examination alone? Should it include cardiac investigation as a routine? And specifically, what is the role of the electrocardiogram or the ECG? How often should it be done? And when you find abnormalities, how do you handle the athlete? 
who engage in regular long-term intensive exercise has what we call increased legal tone and increased the size, leading to changes and health that are considered normal. So for example, all of these things here, which would be considered abnormal in a non athlete are actually started commonly in those athletes who engage in regular and high intensity exercise. To include this interpretation, many tools have been developed to help the clinician interpret Regardless of the procedures, the sample, the tool, the European Society of Cardiology, and its so called Siakari um, interpretation of Siakari criteria, the Siakari criteria actually also form the other two, both in false positive, the lowest false positive rate, as well as therefore reducing the need to, to have a secondary investigation of follow up. And this is important. The other criteria is so uh, it, 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 here. So we learned to do the incorporate normal, and they're very satisfied by the very detailed um, indications of what is abnormal in an athlete. And anything you find here would then dictate that the request that is asking in Followed up either by cardiology and or for the testing. For example, those who are echocardiography also have uh, a stress test. Who does it? And that has always been an, an issue. If you look at the scale of the really high powered and highly skilled individuals to interpret the disease. And this is a very nice study that I found. And what is this? who does no more inexperience in reading ECG um, for applicants. Compare them reading it before the use of the tool and after the use of a standardized tool. And what is shown that right across the board that the, their ability or their accuracy increased by using such a tool. Important because it means that it is perhaps not necessary for an ECG to be done as interpreted only by a cardiologist. There are some numerous studies and numerous concerns that are kind of missing. There were two pretty much before, there were two categories, normal and the abnormal, the scatter criteria. And it said if you have normal scientists such as these, not the normal for the athlete, then no further evaluation is required. If you had any sign on the abnormal side, then further evaluation is required. But then recently, this was came in. I thought it was borderline part. It said, yes, we recognize it's abnormal, and it may be a different, but only if it is said with two or more of these features are present, should we then ask the athlete to have further testing. So the general recommendation, and this is the American Heart Association's recommendation, is that a history and examination should be part of the vascular history examination should be a part of that total evaluation of an athlete. And further, part of investigations such as ECGs and echocardiograms may be done. Not that it should be done. And that is the American um, recommendation. And this is a certain element um, to the problem of the cardiovascular disease. Number six and seven, they added recently. And I highlight number 10 because if you look at it, most of these disorders here will not be picked up for 
study on history and examination, long QT syndrome, for example, is not going to be picked up solely on a history and examination. And yet, the athlete knows that there's that same problem in the family or in that athlete. And if therefore the athlete is doing the examination for the first time or the examination rather for the first time, this may be missed. And therefore, it begs the question is it really that we should only do um, history and a physical examination? When it comes to persons over the age of 35, it is said that regardless of anything else, that we know that the ECG, they say, they're adding to themselves that in this age group, ECG alone, as part of your cardiac investigation, is not sufficient to actually need to check in those persons. And no, even the what you may call the leisure athlete. And in these, there, there are two modes. If you are an older athlete and you are active and you want to do high intensity activity, not only with your self assessment, but you have to get a physical examination by a physician. You have to look at your cardiovascular risk for your body. And if there is a recommendation that you do exercise just firstly, and it is a little bit of a sedentary, or if you're sedentary, any body to high intensity activity that you intend to do must be cleared by a physician with further charging testing. Recently, with the COVID, let's say, due the pandemic, this has been added to the questionnaire part of that charging activity. One, to help detect whether or not the athlete might need to be tested for COVID, or two, in the athlete who has had COVID, what are there any symptoms that may suggest that the athlete needs to be investigated further? So this is a supplemental to that uh, fourth item evaluation we saw earlier. How often should the athlete be evaluated? Now, this is a study coming out that shows that in a particular athlete, when you um, evaluated at age 18 for the first time he was evaluated. His head by, by the normal, right, he would just begin in B5 here to get to show some abnormality. He was examined by, by us at the cardiologist as a study, and it was normal. Consider now two years later, this is what his ECG looks like, and for those of you can immediately recognize that something is very wrong with this patient. And indeed, if further testing or retesting picked up that he now has hypertrophic child of myopathy. And remember that the common is called a sudden death in an athlete. A very nice study coming out of Italy shows that when you compare athletes who have done only a first screening, you pick up the you pick up abnormality, yes, but for repeated screening, their detection or pickup rate in the same athletes improved by three times. So the, the, the point being made here is that participation screening or target back to the screening to determine risk and to help you to guide the athlete should never be done at one time. It should be done purely. Let us look at some of the recommendations for selected cardiac uh, condition periods. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we're not, again, going to talk about all of this. But I, I hope you notice something when we go through these uh, this pairs. It's quite clear participation in high intensity exercise, not recommended if you have all these other things. So, yes, you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But that alone is not sufficient to prevent the athlete from participating in sports. You have to have other things here, right? If you have these things, then you cannot um, participate in high intensity exercise. But the one which this is relatively uncommon, but still occurs in most studies, you see that this is, is in fact 
one of the higher, um, one of the things that can cause death in a, in a, Again, high intensity um, participation is not recommended, right, in, in, in persons who have this condition. Low intensity for all types. So whether you have a genetic typing or not, if you have a genetic cardiomyopathy, then you can participate in sports that's only low intensity sports. Myocarditis is, is particularly or pericarditis is one of those things uh, that there's a lot of interest in. And yes, if you have fully recovered, then you can participate in, in competitive sports. If you have constricted pericarditis, you should not be participate in moderate to high intensity exercise. If you have recent myocarditis or pericarditis, no leisure time or competitive sports, and there's no moderate to high intensity exercise for so six months after an acute stop. So, once we identify myocarditis, but we're not saying never to do it, we're saying that there are some conditions you have to satisfy first. We can talk about my COVID-19 and the heart, especially now. And we know that my target injury varies between 10 to 20, 27% um, in patients who have been hospitalized with COVID-19, the mortality that is higher 69%. And that those who have recovered have cardiac abnormality, which predisposes them to sudden cardiac death. And particularly, COVID-19 increased the risk of myocarditis or inflammation of the heart. Therefore, the recommendation is that if you have recovered from COVID-19 and you have and you're symptomatic, and or you had a history where you were admitted for COVID-19 with severe illness that you should have cardiac testing done, and that goes beyond an electrocardiogram. If you have new infection or present infection, you should not be exercising for 14 days, and you should be symptom-free for at least 14 days before you can return to light exercise. And anyone who's had COVID it is recommended that they should have at least an ECG before they return even to light exercise. That is the current recommendation. Now we look at other things like long QT syndrome. Remember these pre predisposed patients to an abnormal rhythm of the heart. The recommendation depends on a few things. No high intensity sport, oh, I'm sorry, right? Even if you are treated, if your QTC is greater than 500 millisecond, which is high, because lots of studies show that really the risk of having a ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia suddenly down increases when this value is greater than 500 milliseconds. But notice that in this second one, you will have to accept a lower QTC in males and females if there is genetic confirmation that you have long QT and clear in light of public. Because genetic typing of athletes is not commonplace, it's expensive, right? And therefore, it begs the question are we missing persons? If their QTC comes up on ECGS 470 milliseconds, what should you do? And again, who is going to pay for this? And what do you then tell the athlete who cannot afford, say, the further testing? And of course, if you have a, an implantable defibrillator, then you should not be involved in competitive sport if you have had a prior cardiac arrest or you had fainting or syncope, along with the long QT syndrome. Regardless syndrome, again, is another um, 
condition to the sodium arrhythmias. And the recommendation pretty much is that you don't want to have if the person can participate in sports, but not if that sport is likely to increase the sport temperature to break it down 39 degrees Celsius. And you should, of course, be on medication, but not so that they aggravate the condition you to avoid electrolyte abnormality. And pretty much, you should have an implantable defibrillator if the data syndrome is identified. How then to prepare a cardiac ready for the community? Well, the notion of a pre participation evaluation, I think, is outdated. And what really you should have is periodic health evaluation. And this should be done at least annually. An ECG, I suggest, uh, I would say strongly recommend it because study after study shows that a history and an examination are not enough to pick up things that are potentially life-threatening to an athlete. Further, that when you want to do your screening, it should be um, guided by all the various tools out there that specialist guided treatment of abnormalities should be done. And that any decision to prohibit or allow participation in sports should be shared among the stakeholders, meaning the athlete, the, the institution, the, uh, the cardiologist, and the, the family physician. All should make informed decisions. You clearly should engage in good health practices and maintain a good level of fitness. Now, when you look at persons who talk about being a, of, of a cardiac ready um, for the community, all of them, especially those persons who do not advocate routine cardiac evaluation beyond history and examination, will say that. In any sport, the athlete should ensure that whenever he or she participates in sport, they should make sure that there is an AED outside. And further, that the, there should be someone who is trained in, in doing or uh, in operating an AED. And that is considered sufficient. I, perhaps why I agree with an AED. I think that anyone who is preparing for sport should not rely on simply on the presence of an AED to make them see that they are okay. Okay. Notwithstanding all of that, I urge you to remember that habitual exercise is recommended. And even in the older athletes, it has been shown to decrease the risk of that having infarction or heart attack, and therefore decrease the risk of sudden death. And this is recommended really to help you to prepare for your heart. If you were to do this and do this well, you will have a good score. Um, we will ensure not only that we are fit, but that we do well and that we don't die. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and attention. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Hudson. And I just want to mention the fact that we do SEA screening right here at the Heart Foundation.
Yeah. All right, so we now move on to our All right, my apologies for that audio. Um, thank you, Dr. Hudson, for that riveting and informative presentation. Um, I would just like to mention the fact, too, that we do SCA screening right here at the Heart Foundation of Jamaica. Now, we acknowledge your questions. We're going to put forward them now. We're going to start with the question uh, regarding Early Childhood Commission. All right, so this one says... Early Childhood Commission require that all staff do CPR training. Which course do they do? Now, the answer to that is we, they ought to do the Heart Save or CPR and first aid combination courses. The other question is, what is the cost of an AED? The answer to that is, are you hearing me just? Okay, the answer to that is, the cost of an AED is $260,000 plus tax. I must mention too, more importantly, that we do have a special for or until August 31st, where we gave a 20% discount on the cost. Now, this question seems as if it is for Dr. Hudson. So Dr. Hudson, please be on standby to answer this one. It says, Cardiac arrest is more common in male athletes. Is this because the hormones of females play a protective factor? If you'd like me to repeat the question, Dr. Hudson, please let me know. The question is, cardiac arrest is more common in male athletes. Is this because the hormones of females play a protective factor? Want me to answer yes, now, please. Or sure. Answer? Yes, you can go ahead and answer. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, if you look at the if you look at um, the cause of or the commonest cause of sudden cardiac death has to do with hypertrophy and hormones or female or, or, or hormonal protection um, in females tend to protect against coronary artery disease, um, not so much as um, structural heart disease, which is what um, you find in in, um, in, in males, or, or what you find in sudden cardiac death. Um, why it is present, we're not sure, um, but it is just something that we found that in, indeed it's just the heart enlarging in these individuals. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Hudson. All right, the next question is, an equipped hospital was mentioned in the first two presentations as one of the ways to improve survival rate. What does the hospital need, what does the hospital need, hospitals need to be fully equipped? Dr. Wang, this question is for you. Um, good afternoon, thank you for the question. I think that came from um, Ms. McKenzie, I think. Uh, so, post cardiac arrest care is pretty um, technical, and not all hospitals, you will imagine, will have um, the, the, the staff nor the equipment to manage all these cases. Um, in terms of setting up a cardiac ready community, it is hoped that each hospital, even a type C, would be able to provide the, the um, technical support for such a person. And so in terms of equipment, we think even a type C hospital should have at least a, a ICU bed or two that is, um, has the ventilators and the, the um, other equipment and the staff required to um, keep that patient um, alive. Okay, so in terms of fully being fully equipped, these are some of the things we're considering. ICUs, um, intensive care nurses, um, intensivist um, physicians, and so on. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Wong. You have the other questions. Um, you, you may proceed to answer oh, those. Yes. Um, I think Dr. Campbell, John Campbell asked about the, the, the data. So the 
EMS through the JFB has a reporting um, structure that they provide um, some data to the Ministry of Health pertaining to their activities. And this would include um, such things as calls for persons of suffered cardiac arrest. Unfortunately, this data um, has not been published. And um, it, in my searches, unless I went to that source, I would not have that data. Suffice it to say though, um, the practicality on the ground is that people have sudden cardiac arrest and do not recognize it, nor is there an EMS response to that patient. Therefore, people are dying of sudden cardiac arrest and are presenting to hospital as dead on arrivals or um, being transported to hospital, um, you know, in a mortuary vehicle or, or some such thing because the system does not, the system does not allow one for the proper EMS response and two, there's no system for data collection. Um, so out of hospital cardiac arrest would be the remit really of the EMS system. But the EMS system, as you know, in Jamaica is um, really restricted certain geographical areas. And even then, the, the, the resources of that system would not provide for all the data being collected. All right. Um, I do agree that empirical data can advise policy, and this is why we, going forward, this is why we would have to to recognize and and you know find um, means of collecting this data. Uh, so that is this is a beginning. So we can have the data and present it. Probably at the next meeting, we can give you something more. All right, so we have another question here. This one goes to Mr. Lloyd. Is CPR training mandatory for firefighters and are they obligated to perform it? All right, uh, in answering that question, yes. CPR training at the basic first aid level is mandatory for all persons at the entry level of firefighting through our training program. The training school offers them up to an emergency medical responder training and it is mandated once on an active scene that they should perform CPR if they are so equipped to do so. All right, thank you so much. Another question, and this is our final question that we're gonna take. This one says, I'm not sure if it was mentioned and I, or I missed it, but how soon after COVID recovery of a symptomatic person who was admitted to hospital, do you recommend a cardiac screening and is an ECG sufficient and is it necessary? This question goes to Dr. Wong. Dr. Hudson, my apologies. Um, if you have recovered completely from COVID, it depends on where you start. So if you have severe illness that required you to be hospitalized and you recover, you need, it is recommended that you have a, a complete or more extensive cardiac evaluation to include an ECG, but beyond an ECG. That's first. Any person who has COVID or who had a history of COVID perhaps maybe four weeks ago, but still have ongoing symptoms, they too also require a full cardiac workup to include an ECG plus other things. And what are the other things? It may include, it's suggested that they get ECG, echocardiogram, cardiac biomarkers, may even include a cardiac MRI. And of course, what you're trying to find out is whether or not there is underlying myocarditis, which we know has a high mortality in persons. And further, that exercise induces um, the risk of, of myocarditis and death resulting from it. If you have a new infection, a new recent infection, it is recommended that you should be symptom free or that you should not do any exercise at all for 14 days. Then if you have been symptom free for at least seven days, before you even return to sport or light 
training, you should have an ECG done. So I hope that that, that helps, with, that answers the question. So essentially, if you've had COVID-19 as an athlete, you should really, con that athlete should be, should, should be screened heavily to ensure they have no risk factor for myocarditis and they should have an ECG prior to returning to sport. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Hudson. Now we have a giveaway courtesy of the Heart Foundation of Jamaica. And the first person to send us a direct message will receive a prize. Ready? Let's go. All right. What are the four ECC courses offered right here at the Heart Foundation? I know you're clicking away, but let me repeat. What are the four ECC courses offered here at the Heart Foundation? All right, nobody yet. It's a very nice prize, I must say. <laughs> and, oh. All right, somebody is putting something in the chat, but they need one more. All right, you still need another. Oh, all right. No. All right, we have many persons <laughs> put it in, in the chat. We are actually looking for the correct answer. Okay, and we have identified a winner. All right, at this time, I'm going to ask our executive director to lead us out with the vote of thanks. Hello, everybody. So I've been told that the winner of the giveaway is Susie. What, what is the prize? I'm going to ask my team members. Are we not a lot? You're going to tell Susie. <laughs> All right. So Susie, the team will be contacted, contacting you shortly. So it just leaves it for me to say thanks on your behalf. I thought they were wonderful presentations. I think we learned a lot. It's very appropriate and it certainly will keep us on our toes. Um, a lot of good information. Um, remember all of those of you who your certification has expired, please contact us. Or if you have never been certified, then please make it a first time. So thanks very much to Dr. Wong, Mr. Damian Lloyd and Dr. Hudson. Excellent presentations. And to you who took the time out to attend, to be with the Heart Foundation on this rainy evening. Ms. Williams at June Pharmacy, we'd like to thank you so much. We couldn't do it without you. And we really, we really appreciate your support of the Heart Foundation of Jamaica. To all the team members who are here on location, as you know, when you have an event such as this, there's many team members who work behind the scenes. And we'd really like to thank Ms. Kadian Milton and her team for putting together this excellent presentation. Just to let you know, your electronic certificates will be ready by the 30th of August, which is Monday. And um, you can email us, we'll send it to you, but in case you want to contact us, the number was put in the chat, you can use that same number, but it's 876-789-2705 or PRO at heartfoundationja.org. But you should be hearing from us from the 30th onwards so that you can get your certification to claim your hours. So thanks once again, and to the members of our board, Dr. Andrew Chung, our chair, who was online throughout. And thank you all for attending. And we certainly will be doing this again next year during CPI week. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you at one of our courses very soon. Thank you.